Harry Eastlack Jr. was born on November the 17th in 1933 in Philadelphia. When he was four years old, he was hit by a car and he broke his left femur. He was taken to the hospital where his leg was put into a cast, but the fracture never healed properly. So when he was discharged from the hospital, a noticeable bump had formed on the front of his left thigh. When his cast was removed months later, his leg was swollen and inflamed, and soon it was difficult for him to move his hips and his knees. In 1938, a year after his fracture, he was diagnosed with what is now known as fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, which means soft connective tissue that progressively turns to bone. The bone grows outside of the skeleton, so it's often referred to as growing a second skeleton. By 1946, his body was permanently angled in the bowed position. His spine was fused and the muscles in his upper back were ossified or had turned to bone. FOP is one of the rarest and most disabling genetic conditions known to medicine. It affects around 1 in 2 million births and researchers are aware of about 900 people around the world and less than 300 in the United States. At this time, there is no other example in medicine of one normal organ system turning into another. Life with FOP becomes progressively painful and more restrictive as the person gets older and they develop hard, jagged bones that dig into their soft tissue. The person is eventually locked into one position over time. The life expectancy is 56 years old and there's currently no cure or effective treatment. When it comes to FOP, one common cause of death is cardiorespiratory failure as the heart and lungs eventually just can't function with the constrictive armor of bone. The main sign at birth that a child has FOP are short, crooked, big toes. As a baby, Harry's big toes were crooked and a lot shorter than normal, but little was known about FOP back then, so it wasn't recognized as a symptom. FOP is called stone man syndrome but because it causes the muscles, the ligaments, and tendons to turn to bone after an injury or an illness. The body becomes frozen, almost like a statue, and it can feel like your bones are trying to come out of your skin. It's an extremely painful condition. After someone with FOP gets an injury, there's a flare-up or a painful soft tissue swelling. The area will then become hot, red, and swollen and within days or weeks, a new piece of bone forms. Flare-ups can happen spontaneously, but they're usually caused by bumps or bruises or falls, viral infections, or overexertion. Those with FOP can form bone spurs after something as simple as a childhood immunization. At the start of a flare-up, immune cells invade bruised muscles, but instead of healing the area, they destroy it. Harry underwent 11 surgeries but that only made things worse and it caused his body to repair all of that damaged tissue with even more bone. But this wasn't known to be an issue at the time. A joint can overlock and never move again. Most develop their first extra bone around five years old and their second skeletons usually start from the spine down and by age 15, they have lost a great deal of their upper body mobility. Some patients end up frozen in a standing position and they can only sleep while leaning in a corner. Some are frozen in the seated position or some may be twisted to one side. When Harry was little, he had difficulty sitting down and his hips were one of the first to turn to stone. And one time he actually bumped into a radiator and a bruise formed. The smooth tissue was destroyed and more new bone formed. And from 11 years on, he was locked in the bowed position. In 1948, when he was 15, his jaw had fused to his skull and he was no longer able to eat solid foods and he had to speak through clenched teeth. And by his mid-twenties, his spine had completely fused. Even though Harry was suffering, he had a pretty decent childhood. He liked to listen to music and he loved to read and play cards with his sister. And he also loved going to the movies. At the theater, he had a special seat where he could recline and stretch out his leg because it could no longer bend. But as his disease progressed, moving around became harder and harder, and it became even more difficult for him to take care of himself because bone had formed across his upper arms and onto his sternum, so his arms were basically attached to his chest. 
and his mother Helen took care of him for as long as she could. But when he was 25, she became too weak to care for him, so he was taken to English House, which is a facility for those with severe neurodegenerative disabilities who can live in a home-like environment. While he was at the English house, he broke his right leg and it healed at an odd angle. And this caused him to be bedridden and he eventually developed bronchial pneumonia. Now, the only thing that he could move were his eyes, his lips, and his tongue. Due to the extra bone on his ribs, his lungs couldn't expand well enough so he couldn't cough. He was being suffocated by his own bones. On November the 11th, 1973, six days before his 40th birthday, he died of pneumonia. And before he died, he told his sister that he wanted to donate his body and his medical records to science so that doctors and researchers could better understand the disease. And he didn't want anyone else to suffer as he had. Harry's skeleton was initially at the Temple University School of Medicine, but in 1979, his skeleton was on exhibit at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia. His skeleton didn't require most of the usual rigging or articulating, as it's called, that's done with fine wires and glue, since his skeleton was almost completely fused into one piece. A normal skeleton would just fall on the floor in a pile of bones once the flesh and the connective tissues are removed and Harry's skeleton could almost stand on its own without any additional support. Bone had locked his spine to his skull and his skull to his jaw. Bone went from his spine to his limbs and they locked his shoulders, his elbows, his hips, and his knees in place. Harry never had the chance to meet anyone with FOP, but one patient in particular visited his skeleton at the Moodham Museum in 1995 during an international conference for those with FOP and their families. And she said that when her time came, she wanted to be next to Harry. She wanted to be an inspiration for students, scientists, and doctors for years to come with one stipulation. Her jewelry had to be displayed beside her skeleton. She called herself the Queen of Bling. Her name was Carol Ann Orzel. Carol was born on April 20th, 1959, and she was diagnosed with FOP as a child. By the time she was 23, she could no longer stand without a cane, and she needed help with daily tasks because she couldn't bend her elbows. She had also lost both of her parents by then, so when aunt helped her move to English House, the same facility that Harry was in before he died in 1973. Carol loved fashion, and a seamstress at English House modified her clothing to make dressing easier. She also liked to look good, so she learned how to do her hair and her makeup, even with limited movement. She was also an artist. Every year for decades, she would give talks to Penn's incoming medical students to help them better understand those with disabilities, especially FOP. She used her life to teach others about the disease. She was mostly confined to her bed for the last three years of her life, and she died in 2018. She was 58 years old. She lived about 10 years longer than most people with FOP. She had zero body fat, very little muscle tissue, and her four foot seven skeleton weighed about five pounds or the size of two thigh bones. Parts of her skeleton were extremely lightweight, like a cheese puff. And on top of FOP, she also suffered bone loss like many postmenopausal women do in their 50s. Her skeleton was also completely fused like Harry's, but turning her into a skeleton was a lot more difficult than usual. Carol's skeleton was almost like taking cotton candy and hairspray. The Wooter Museum is fascinating, and it's a collection of medical specimens that you won't see anywhere else in the United States. Some of the specimens include conjoined or Siamese twins, Chang and Ang Bunker. They were from Siam, which is in Thailand, so that's where the term Siamese twins came from. There are several slides of Einstein's brain. There's a book that's bound in human skin. There's the soap lady and human abnormalities like the tallest skeleton in the world and a fetus that's missing most of its brain. There's a fetus with cyclopia or one eye. There's the three foot six skeleton of Mary Ashbury, a woman with the chondroplasia who became pregnant out of wedlock in the 1850s while she was living in a brothel in Norfolk, Virginia, and she died giving birth. Her pelvis was extremely small and the baby's head was large, so delivery by hand or forceps was impossible. Plus her pelvis was tilted, 
So they broke the baby's skull bone, but they couldn't collapse his head, so they had to perform a C-section. They didn't know about germs at the time, so they didn't wash their hands nor their surgical instruments, so Mary died three days later from infection. There is also a model of the brain of Laura Bridgman, the first deaf, blind, and mute person to be successfully educated. She became deaf and blind due to scarlet fever, and it's where Katherine Keller heard of her. Katherine Keller was the mother of Helen Keller.